So I want to echo Jody's welcome. Um, I'm delighted to have you all here to this afternoon and to see so many of you. Um, and I wanted to give you just a little bit of background. Um, so our congregation is currently engaged in conversation and learning around racial justice and have been since January. So this is a, an active conversation in our congregation and we're really excited that you're here to join us in that this afternoon and that we um, have Mr. Martin Henson who's going to share with us a little bit more about what he does. Um, so we heard in February that Black Lives Matter Boston was looking for places to speak. And I think lots of people heard because they've been all over in the past few months and we're excited to be the next stop on that trip. Um, so I am really excited and grateful to welcome Mr. Martin Henson here today. Martin is an activist, organizer, and mental health counselor. His interests include alternative community structures, dismantling white supremacy, and intersectional movement and coalition building. What a great list. Um, his work includes being an organizer for Black Lives Matter Boston, and he often speaks to various groups about the importance of BLM's presence in the narrative of America's history and current political climate. So welcome to all of you, and a special welcome to Mr. Martin Henson. I'll turn it over to you now. Good to see you all. Thank you for coming out. Whew, it's been a long day. Um, and I'm, I'm gonna talk to you about a lot of things. Get a little heavy. Uh, I want you to ask questions honestly as they occur to you. Uh, people a lot of times say, there's no such thing as a stupid question. There is a such thing as a stupid question. <laughs> <laughs> but I will answer it if you need. <laughs> You need more clarification. <laughs> so, let's get to it. I'm Martin Hansen. My pronouns are he, him, his. I'm from Black Lives Matter Boston. Uh, and I'm going to tell you a little bit about the history of it. So, Black Lives Matter uh, started after uh, the acquittal of George Zimmerman uh, uh, for the killing of Trayvon Martin back in 2012. And one of the founders, uh, posted a, a status on Facebook uh, talking about the, just, just the reaction and Black Lives Matter was, that came out of that. And oftentimes I say, what do, you, what do you say when you see people being killed and put on trial for their death? Uh, what, do you, what do you say to that? And I don't, I don't, I still a lot of times don't, don't know what to say, even though I, I still do this because it's still happening. You would think it wouldn't, but it does. And Black Lives Matter is what happened. So artists, artists and activists uh, and, and organizers and community people came together to, to make Black Lives Matter what it is. So in terms of the Boston chapter, uh, Mike Brown uh, was killed and there was a, a acquittal or a non-indictment of uh, uh, his killer. And there was a call put out uh, back in 2014 for people to come to Ferguson and be a part. Um, people took buses, uh, cars, there was just tons of activists, tons of uh, healing workers, uh, tons of even just everyday people who came out there. And from that group, the bus that went down there, the one that came back, came to Boston chapter of Black Lives Matter. And I came on in 2015 or 2017, so I've been around for a, a little bit. Uh, so that's, that's kind of where we are. That's, that's a little bit of the history to frame it. Uh, so to talk a little bit more about our principles and our values, I always introduce by saying that I understand that I'm a, a black man and understanding that my existence, whether I am conscious or not within patriarchy uh, and how that has affected the queer and transgender community. I always say first that we're queer and transgender affirming as a, a principle, a value, a practice. Not only are we uh, queer and transgender affirming, we center them within the, the black experience because they are the most marginalized of us. And if we uplift them, then we uplift everyone. So that we use that as a principle of value, as a strategy for building, because we have to take care of the people who are uh, getting 
uh, the boot the most. We have to take care of our people. Um, so that's, that's one of our, our main principles. The next one is, is uh, understanding black women and, and re-evoking that amazing power that they've always had. Oftentimes there's a tendency uh, to render them invisible. Oftentimes by way of people like me, I, people may consider me the charismatic black man that's supposed to lead the movement. And I would say to them that like, I've, I've never been the only face, or people look like they've never been the only face to lead the movement. There have been women who uh, have been the lifeblood in so many ways, but because they don't have the, the ideal look of what power is supposed to look like, and they're not recognized as such. Uh, the three black women started this, uh, uh, two of them being queer. Like, I have to acknowledge that and recognize it because it gives me the ability to stand in the position that I'm in. If it, would, if it wasn't for them, I wouldn't be here. And if it wasn't for all the, the, the Ella Bakers and the Ida B. Wells, all the, uh, uh, and the Sojourner Truths, all those people doing that work, then I wouldn't be here. Uh, also, so Black, Black Lives Matter is all around the world. Uh, we're, uh, we are uh, multinational, international. There's people doing work that is within the context of whatever community it is that they come from. Uh, oppression looks different in a lot of different w ways. Racism looks different in a lot of different ways from country to country. The rules change, but oppression remains the same. And people are organizing to take care of that and to address it in a way that makes sense for their people. We're also uh, about black villages and understanding that we come in more than just the, the mom, dad, child format that we're prescribed. Uh, there are all different constellations and formulations of families that exist, that have been supporting us, that have been nurturing us, uh, that will, have been here and will continue to be here. And I always want to say that and lift that up. Uh, thinking about that, we're intergenerational. So there is no, and within Black Lives Matter, there's not any age requirement. You don't have to be able to bench press 225 to be able to be a part of it. Everybody's affected by racism. Uh, you know, in the black community. So why would that be limited to only a few people? It doesn't make any sense. So you might have uh, a youth, you might have parents, you might have grandparents, you know, great. If, we, if you've been active that long, I don't know if you've even made it because it's, it's not a good health outcome to be active, to be honest with you. Uh, but everybody within the family can be a part of it. And we want to make it as inclusive as possible. So going to like the next thing that we, we are inclusive, uh, Black Lives Matter, and within the movement, the black people who are uh, uh, queer, transgender, incarcerated, or formerly incarcerated, uh, whatever level of ability that they may have, uh, whatever health, uh, whether English is their first language or not, uh, whether they're, they're immigrant, undocumented, we all in here trying to do that because we all trying to get free. So, uh, and then let me get to a couple of the ones I tend to say at the end for a special clarification. We, uh, Black Lives Matter is an ideological and a political form of resistance to the constant invalidation of, of black life, constant threat on our very existence uh, through uh, one way through state violence and not just a typical way, a way the police officers or to call the National Guard out on us by not funding our schools by not uh, giving us uh, access to, to food, by running uh, freeways and trains through our neighborhoods when we began to become in, independent, uh, by denying us our history. All of these things fall under the level of state uh, violence for us. And, uh, and even a more direct thing, thinking of uh, Tulsa, Oklahoma, where they dropped bombs on uh, Black Wall Street because it was Black Wall Street, for no other reason. Uh, so understand that that's, what, that's why we had to do it. With that, uh, I am, am unapologetically black. I don't have to qualify that. I don't have to give you an explanation. I do it for clarification, because I'm out here speaking to you about Black Lives Matter. But if I didn't want to, I wouldn't. So I love myself. There is no part of myself that I will ever apologize for or should have to apologize for. And if you are black or even a person of color, you should never have to do that. So we have to be clear about that because part of our existence within uh, the, the American continent is that you are expected to shrink yourself to fit white views of comfort 
and normalcy. Part of that being your black skin is seen as violent, is seen as aggressive, is seen as over sexualized, is seen as ignorant. So I love my melanin. I will always love my melanin. I say that as much as I can, just so you know and you clear. If you remember nothing else, he loves being black and all other black people love being black too. They should or they don't. Um, so yeah, that's, that's or a couple of you know, things to get clear about. Um, right now, the thing that has been on my mind is, is how, what power is and what language is and how we've gotten to this point. It's just so, people act confused or maybe they genuinely are when you see the rise of, of Trump. Uh, you see, uh, or somebody, one of, one of my friends calls him Agent 45, which I think is so dope. Think about it, It'll, you'll catch it on the way home if you don't get it. Um, it's, uh, people are confused about it. They don't know. And I don't understand where that confusion comes from. So you got somebody who gets elected and openly told uh, sexist, uh, uh, misogynistic, racist, uh, xenophobic rhetoric and uses these, these coded words to speak to black people and the sentiment of blackness being scary and needing to be dominated and controlled, such as uh, inner city, uh, such as states' rights, um, uh, such as uh, urban, or we're calling us the blacks. Uh, these things that happen and that speak to a particular part of people that want to maintain power and control and think that black people should be in certain positions. So when somebody like that, who is the president of the free world in a lot of ways, gets up there and, and says it, speaks to those sentiments and gets elected and then suddenly people are confused because they don't want to acknowledge that they, those words spoke to them. They felt connected when he said things like that about black people, when he said things like that about immigrant people, when he said things like that about women. So we don't understand or have a better analysis of, of what our culture is or what our language is and what the power is. Here's something I want you to think about. There is no word that we commonly use to refer to fear of black people. Why is that? I know that everyone's afraid of me. I know that if I walk down a street, I stay in Boston, I don't know if you know about Newton, if I used to walk back and forth from the train when I was going out doing things. If I walk down the street at night and a white woman came out and shot me in the face, she's not going to jail. She's not, it doesn't matter. That's my reality, is that people are fearing me. It colors my perception, but we don't even have a word for it. But then, okay, well, let's think a little bit deeper about it. Um, words are, are, and dictionaries are defined by use. It's not it's something that's some steady standard. Like if people use a word enough, then it gets in a dictionary. Like Miley Cyrus popularized YOLO, but it came from black people, of course. But who had to say it for it to get into that thing, that lexicon? Who writes the dictionaries? Who writes the encyclopedias? So if I'm even looking for a language to describe my experience, I don't have it. And if I create it, it will not be validated. <laughs> it's the same reason why we don't have a word for uh, uh, fear of Christianity uh, or fear of America, because it's the dominant narrative. You don't have to have words for it when the dominant narrative is to think that way. So when you have that, people within this dominant position don't understand their uniqueness. They see it as the norm. So white people came over and took on whiteness uh, as a way of, of maintaining power and control and, and got rid of the, the, the French American and that idea of the German American. They said, I'm white. You, you check that white box. You don't check the other ones. You don't say other. You say I'm white because there's power and there are privileges that come with it. But meanwhile, the ways in which I'm oppressed by virtue of this group of people, I don't even have a word that's even acknowledged for it. Don't even have that. So I have to get up here and come and explain it to you and break down a culture that I exist a part of that the people in the dominant culture don't even have to be aware of. That's the contradiction that I sit with 
every day. I do this every day. I have to read, you know, reading articles to see what's the most recent black person that's been killed so I know if somebody asks me because I'm a part of Black Lives Matter. I have to know what black death is as it happens. Have to be aware of that. I have to go, I have to see my history. Let's say Egypt, for example, in museums, their most precious right within their lives was their religion. And we got it plastered all over walls. We've taken the, 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 the thing that they held the most dear and we've ravished ravaged it and put it up on display. That's not, that's not us trying to curate those things and hold it. That's signs of conquest. But we have, have, to under, have to have an understanding of it that doesn't call it as such. We can't call it that because people stop listening when you say, say well, that, that, doesn't, that doesn't work for me. I can't have my history. I can't have a language. I can't have anything. We came over here and, and, and black women being able to raising white children who took parts of our culture and never attributed to us. We can't even get it back. Most of Egyptology is maintained by white people. We got to do a study of the transatlantic slave trade. A lot of our, uh, uh, our African American history courses across the US are being getting rid of. We got to fight for that. I don't know anything less than a fight. So I come into these spaces and I have to talk about it. I don't, but I don't know where the energy of the, the people are that I'm talking to. This is my reality. It's my reality. So black people with all of these things, well, the, the, the realization that I'm left with is that we're colonized people. It's racism. And the colonization led to that. Colonize the coast, take us, bring us over, and displace the Native American people. I know that. People tell me that like, they family crest is this. I'm like, you know it? That must be good for you. I know my, my great great were slaves. That's what I know. And I know that when I start talking about my history, people will push you out of some shit because they feel uncomfortable. That's what I know. This is the world that we live in. So you, you're talking about black folks who are being killed constantly by way of this racist system uh, that came with colonization. Because I, I have realized I talk about racism a lot and I realize, okay, well, let me break down colonization. That's when one country uh, sends a group of their people over to another country and, and, and rules by that, by displacing that, that other group of people. With that, the people that they displace have to learn rules and norms for engagement with that colonizing group so we don't get killed. So when I'm talking, I was telling somebody today, and talk about organizing, when you organize it with different groups of people and coalition building, I said, when you organize with white people, it takes a whole different type of work. Because you gotta break down to them ways in which they engage in racism, ways in which they engage in this post-colonial behavior, the expectations that they have in conversation for control and comfort. I have to explain that to you as the person who you do it to in order for you to help me get free of something that you are a part of. That don't make no fucking sense to me. It doesn't. But that's, that's, what, that's where I'm at. That's one thing that I have to figure out, I have to deal with, I have to address. Racism, thinking about that, taking a step back from colonization, racism is a system of, of, of privilege uh, with, or, or, or prejudice. Uh, with the power to enforce. So prejudice with the power to enforce, that becomes systematic. So if I were standing on the corner and I said, uh, I hate white people, I, I don't hate white people. Uh, if I said that, nothing would happen. I would just be some random person, uh, somebody would probably call the police on me, whatever. If somebody got on the corner and said, I hate black people, a lot of people, for one, won't say nothing to you. You might have somebody come bring you a flyer for the next Klan meeting or neo-Nazi group in the local area because they are out here, if you didn't know. And not only that, the, the energies within the space that are maintained and navigated uh, by white people, the, the, all the uh, organizations here, 
the, the city council are reflective of those thoughts and sentiments. So they would not respond to it in a way that they would respond to other things. They might say, oh no, we can't do that if it's something else. With this, it might be a little bit more tepid. I'm like, hmm, maybe you shouldn't say that there. Or we all have opinions. You know, the, the universalizing of, of things when somebody has to send is another a characteristic of, of whiteness, uh, of this kind of post-colonial racist thing where when somebody says, I need something, well, everybody needs something. That's where the all lives matter stuff comes. Black lives are all lives matter. But if you say all lives matter as a response, then I must have never been included in that all that you're talking about. And even using language to still perpetuate the same thing. I don't even use universalization, like all, I don't even say it the same way no more. I try to talk around it because I know the type of sentiment that, it has, that runs with it. It's like, damn, okay, I don't even have, so if I'm tired of this language, I'm tired of this framework, maybe I can go back to my country. Oh, but I don't know it because my, I'm descendants of slaves. Maybe I can speak my own language. Oh, but I don't have it because it was taken from me. Or maybe I can reference my history. Oh, but I have to go to the six libraries to define two or three books that tell me what I want to find it out about. A while ago, I was studying, I was studying genocide because uh, I wanted to know and understand it better. But I, I realized I could tell very quickly when white people wrote the book because they didn't talk about the Native Americans and they didn't talk about black people. It wasn't qualified as genocide. And if you really want to take another, another level, they would define themselves out of what is qualified a certain thing. And that's what happens when you have the power to disseminate your own views. When you own all the publications and the radio and the TVs, you can put out your own views. So thinking about what racism is and defining what racism is, if I don't have the power to propagate that view, white people can say, well, racism actually is this. Racism is when you just don't like black people. And that's what people remember. Then I have to come to places like this and have conversations correcting folks. That's what happens. Live a life of constant resistance all the time. And even within that, having to look out for the people who share my plight, uh, Black Lives Matter, working with people who are, are still getting the end of the boot too. Well, just like the, the uh, Muslim ban, we with you. The transgender bathroom ban. Hey, we're with you. We're going to make sure people get taken care of because nobody deserves to get less than something that's validating to their life and their experience. Nobody deserves that. Also knowing at the same time dealing with this contradiction is that black immigrants oftentimes aren't a part of those campaigns. Not even thought of. So I was talking to a friend of mine. We was talking about this whole issue of, of immigration and how black people are not as involved because the same people who are saying, come out here and join us in this immigrant movement, who are immigrants too, be calling you nigga too. So how am I supposed to get involved? I deal with these contradictions all the time, or even with the transgender bathroom ban, and knowing that black women of color, black women and, and black men and women of color are dying, are being killed, and, and within that narrative, a lot of times they're forgotten about. But I'm still ride. I'm still be vocal and say, like, put us in there. And even if it's not my place, I will support the, the black trans women, the black femmes who are in this space. I, I, whatever you need from me, handle that. And I, and I got you. We're living in a life of constant resistance all the time. So racism is a system. Understanding what your identity is and how you are framed within that system. Thinking intersectionally. Uh, intersectionality is just basically saying that our uh, identities and the ways in which we are oppressed and invalidated interweave and overlap. So in some ways I have advantages and in some ways I have disadvantages. So me, using myself as an example, I'm a, uh, a black man, uh, uh, straight, I, 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 I have a little bit of economic privilege, I have a car, uh, I have housing, English is my first language. So those are the things that I, I 
I tend to, to reach toward when I'm trying to make change. I have access to those groups. But also knowing that black people, like black transgender people don't have access to a lot of the same stuff that I have. So I have to work with them, my sisters and brothers, and say, okay, what, what is it that you need from me? How can I not be a part of this culture that forgets you, dehumanizes you, treats you like you're invisible, and over-sexualizes you? How can I not be a part of that? How can I do this? And having to learn and hear from those people. So thinking about somebody who's in a position, a lot of times people ask, well, what can I do? Well, what are the things that compose your identity? Or are you, are you a teacher? Do you own a business? Uh, um, are you educated? If, you, if not, do the formal way. Are you educated through other means? Or do you have transportation? Do you have a community that you can call upon that will that'll help you and work with you? Are you reaching out to those people and trying to understand what, you know, what whiteness is and understand what are the, the plights of black people and to a greater extent people of color are and how you perpetuate that as being a part of the system? Because racism is the baseline. Sorry, to, well, I'm not sorry. This is me bursting your bubble if you thought that you weren't a part of it. Racism is the baseline in America. It spiked with, with Trump, but that's, that's where we are all the time. You know how many times I have to navigate conversations because I'm worried about white women being afraid that I'm either too aggressive or coming on to them? Too many times to count. This, that's the baseline. Got to go to work, can't say too much about black stuff because somebody's gonna feel uncomfortable and then you get that conversation, well, I don't know, you're just not a part of the culture and it doesn't seem like you really wanna be here, you don't seem happy, but oh, here, these things are problems. But hey, look, look at this though. This is what I want you to pay attention to. It's the baseline. So thinking about yourself intersectionally and what you have access to, what are you doing with that? For example, if you're a teacher, do you teach people about racism, systematic oppression? Do you even, on a, on a lesser degree, do you even talk about what differences are? Because we learn not to, to think or talk about what people's differences are, because if you don't understand it, or if you're not competent enough to speak about it, then it, it's okay for it to be invisible. If you, if, you, if you work with kids, so you have kids talk about the difference in like where your, their hair looks, where your skin looks, what melanin is. Do they even know? Do you even know? You should. Or the, the, when the little the subtle microaggressions about, I, I do this because I just think it's funny, but talking to white people about a, a sunscreen lotion. It's just, man, it's just, uh, and I'll say, I'll say, you know, I, I kind of got this natural thing going on, so <laughs> I don't really need that. Like, but everybody needs sunscreen lotion. I'm pretty sure there's a lot of black people who've never had it. We, we, human beings have been around for like, what, 600,000 years. Sunscreen lotion came around the last 50, 100. How did those people survive? I don't know, but everybody needs it. But even in those little small conversations, the framing is everyone that looks like me needs it. And people don't understand or realize that I can say what everyone needs. And since you do not have the power to contest this, that can be treated as if it's valid. Power is the ability to dictate what that means for other people, what it, what it means to create change. That's what power is. So when you have the power to even frame a conversation about power through language, through whatever the medium it is that you're talking about, or even if you're having a conversation at your job about, let's say you're a black person, about like uh, blackness, multiculturalism, you're in a white space with a white boss. They've allowed you so graciously this time to discuss with them what they don't know. There's so many levels of power there. And if you are in a space where you're able to combat that, how much energy are you gonna have after that's over with? But you better be at work tomorrow. Racism is a public health problem. It, it's a stressor that we don't acknowledge. Me being a counselor, doing mental health, that's another part of uh, thinking intersectionally that I have that skill set. I can open the, the DSM-5 and there's nothing about race, nothing. 
but it significantly colors the way that I see my world around me. It significantly colors the way that I interact with people, but there is nothing there. The most recent thing in relation to mental health and mental illness, I was showing, showing you how whiteness and racism and all that white supremacy will adapt and reform. Now that Donald Trump is losing favor, he's now mentally ill. So now we use a stigma of mental illness to address his racism? What? And I'm sitting here watching it, knowing that I'm working with, with kids of color and, and kids who are, are black, and we don't even have, I have to fight to get a group to talk about blackness and the, the, the racial problems that we deal with. I have to fight for it. I have to either own all of it or it's not gonna happen at all. It's the world we live in. Thinking about yourself intersectionally will show you what you can and cannot do. A lot of times people will come up to uh, people in the movement and say, well, what can white people do? Uh, and I just, uh, I hate that question. I, I like, what can people do? That's cool. What can people in this position do? That's cool. What can white people do? I'm like, I'm just not, I'm not actually here for that. That's not what I'm here for. And if that's how you frame it, you need to do some work with a couple of uh, people in like-minded communities, somebody who's read a little bit, they know what their whiteness is, go to a coffee shop or something, get you a spot in the corner, get you a nice little seat, open a book, bring some journaling material if you need to journal, and you work that shit out. <laughs> And then we come back and we have a space where we can talk about, where you understand the framing of whiteness within yourself and what, how it prefaces how you think things should be. Or when you're asking a black organizer, what should white people do? I would say, stop killing us. That would be a start. But you know, they're like, well, what about the police? And can't we just work with the, the police? And they don't think, well, you've given them cameras. And they, they have laws that you can't see the footage on the cameras. They don't release the footage even when they're not laws. I don't, that's too much bullshit. Too much bullshit. People want to deal with that, they can. I'm not the one though. But if all of these things happen. And we have to deal with it and continue. So thinking about you, what you have, what is within your reach. You want to learn, well, well how do I I think racism is horrible. How do I do it? But there's a whole legacy of, of racism in education, in science, in politics, in environment. Where? Where? Which part are you the most, you know, abhorred about? Pick one. And then they're like, okay, well, how do I, I know? But power has a, a way of defining and prescribing for people what they should be okay with. You walk into, if I walk into, uh, um, a McDonald's, and all the, 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 the regular people are black and the supervisor is white. Does that, do you notice that? Does that bother you? I notice it every time. What I notice about white people is that they never notice it. it doesn't bother you. So how can we even talk about this stuff if you don't see these different power differentials that, that alarm you? Because we can talk about it. I was talking about it and thinking about intersectionality when you see the power differentials by way of every other way, by way of religion, by way of sexuality, by way of nationality, people will acknowledge it. And the reason that people will acknowledge it is because there are categories in which white people exist in. So those avenues are there and they will be created because it will benefit you in some way. But when we talk about blackness and even all of the intersectional ways that exist within that blackness, now we can't have a conversation no more unless there's an appeal to somewhere in there. This is what we deal with. So whatever you have access to, and I'm seeing the power differentials and the lack of representation should bother you. If it doesn't, then you got a, you got a lot more work to do before you didn't jump into this type of work. If it don't bother you, then if you can, if you're okay with Columbus Day, then you, you gotta need to, need to read a little bit more. You know, it, it's, it's, something doesn't make a lot of sense. If you see spaces that are all white, then you need to be saying, huh, I wonder why is this the case? You might be a town where there's only white people in the town. All right, well, this is what it is. 
But at least you asked the question. Because a lot of people just won't how it's supposed to be. So looking at the things that you have reached, or within your reach and the things that you have access to, that's how you, you think intersectionally about how you can make an impact. Google is out there. If you want to know about racism in education, Google it. You know, racism in, in the prison industrial complex, Google it. There are also local areas that are doing that work that you can find your way into. Sometimes we know about local stuff that's doing work along certain things or local coalitions. And you're asking, like, is there a coalition working against this specific thing or in this way? Yeah, we can, yeah, we say, yeah, this, 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 this. But if your thing is, what can white people do? Uh, come on. I'm gonna leave you with this and uh, before we go to the other parts. I tell people when I come, I, I don't expect for y'all to get activated and start doing work. History has told me something different. I know when the, back in the Reconstruction after uh, the, the Civil War and the slaves were freed and uh, we started getting some, some things going, uh, the North pulled out of the South and all of those advancements that people of color made were gone. No 40 acres in the mule, none of that. I know that when we started to, when schools were integrated, uh, I know that white people moved away. I know that when we fought wars and we were ineligible for the GI Bill, we didn't get that money. I know that the black codes, Jim Crow laws, came right in succession and they just replaced some of those old systems. I know that the 13th Amendment uh, says that slavery is abolished unless you have committed a crime. And guess who are seen as criminals? I know these things. I, history has not afforded me the convenience to be ignorant of what the likely reality is. Most of you will be doing the same shit you're doing today, tomorrow. And that's all. That's just what it is. Uh, for the ones who decide they want to do more, I won't be in your shoulder or on your shoulder in your ear whispering Black Lives Matter when situations pop off. I won't be there telling you how to have difficult conversations with people who are saying racist things. I won't be there. There won't always be a, a, a training or a manual for how to do these things. You need to make peace with, between yourself and your, in yourself or your, your, your God, the universe, whatever it is that you do or whatever it is that you worship or you look to, you have to find that within that, that space if this is what you wanna do. I don't know. I know that for me to come up into these places and bear witness to my humanity, it, that's, it's something that everybody can't do. Sometimes it can be draining, sometimes not so much. But it, to talk in a room full of white people about how white people are killing black folks is a hell of a contradiction. It is. So, the question that you will have to ask yourself is what are you gonna do? And because of what you're gonna find yourself, if you see that this is something that you wanna take on, you're gonna, there's gonna be a lot of transforming that's gonna have to happen because the way that things are framed is in a, a, a post-colonial racist framework. So you got to step all the way out of that and then you'll find that if I'm saying Black Lives Matter, then I'm saying like, oh, well, I guess yeah, undocumented immigrant people can stay in this country because they're, they're, their humanity is valid too. I guess you know, uh, trans and queer people should not be limited for where they want to go to use the bathroom. It shouldn't even have to be a conversation. I mean, you say, I guess if people end up, I guess, I would hope you would say prisons should be abolished, but if you don't say that, say, then these people are citizens, they should be able to vote. They shouldn't be able to discriminate, be able to be discriminated against. That doesn't make any sense. I'm gonna change the world. I don't know what you're gonna do. That's all I got.